um, get ready to share your target questions. Um, we're going to work now. Now it's full time. So, um, so we're going to do a little experiment in no laptops over this class. But you can leave them open now because I'm going to ask you for your target questions. Do you see submissions? Do I see submissions? Right. Yeah. No. Oh, no. Can I see my submissions? Yeah. I grant you permission to see your submissions. Thank you so much for that. I didn't. Yeah. So, um, an interesting context for the last two lectures is that when you go out into the profession and you uh, are engaging your colleagues, the older colleagues took a course like this. Uh, and just so you know, just so you know, uh, the context of practice when you get out there is the course, the version of this course that your older colleagues took, started with Jericho or Chapo Hoyo or maybe Greece, but it started a long, long time ago. And then because history, because professors tend to get carried away, to put it in a forgiving way, right? Professors get carried away and they think what they're saying is so important and that this history is so important that we study Jericho a lot. Then we study Madurai, India. Then we study, you know, fill in the blank. We study all these ancient places. We study Chatao Hoyot in Turkey. We study Greece. We study Rome. And then we, we step by step inch our way through the history of cities. And around this point in the semester, they get to the Athens Charter, uh, Corbusier, uh, all kinds of things that, uh, this is where we're crossing. And then they rush through anything that's happened since 1968. So 1968 is kind of like this boundary. And then we don't have time, the students are distracted with their studio work, they stop paying attention. And if anyone ever mentions informal cities, it's pretty much in passing. If anyone ever mentions race, uh, no, no, no one ever mentions race. Uh, the automobile, you can't avoid it, but what can you do? It is what it is, and there's never, it's never going to change. But none of this is really covered. So the older colleagues in your firm who are your bosses, they know this stuff really well. They don't know this stuff very well. And your younger colleagues, and, it, and to the extent that anyone at work knows anything about any of this, is because they were interested. And they took an interest in it, and they, they, um, yeah, they learned it on their own. And I'm proving that on purpose, because if you're looking at the world, if you're paying attention and you care, this is what's going to prepare you to face the world with courage and creativity and confidence. This stuff is just to give you the background for how we got here. So we flip the class. And this is where the old way of teaching this course is crossing with the new way. Um, but as a result, the three weeks that, uh, the three or four weeks of the version, older version of this course, um, it would have taken us through the city beautiful movement in one week. And then the next week, we would talk about the garden cities. And then in the next week, we would talk about modern urban ideas of the Athens chart. And then maybe in the next week, we'd study Brasilia and Chandigarh. And then maybe in a fifth week, we'd study Jane Jacobs. Right? So that's five weeks of the old version of the course. We're going to do it in one week. Sorry, and you're welcome. So a lot of ground to cover. But 
the compression of this topic is very much on purpose. Because we're doing it backwards, before we study the city beautiful or the garden cities or the Athens Charter, we benefit from the critique of those two things by Jane Jacobs. So the critique by Jane Jacobs gives us uh, the, the ability, the authority, and the power to see these for what, they're, for what they are. So uh, everyone but Nick, uh, Nick read the introduction to the Jane Jacobs book. And there's a pile of books somewhere that the idea is that we move around class today. But, um, so it wouldn't be crazy for everyone to fill in the gaps of their own education by reading the 25 pages of Jane Jacobs' introduction. Because in it, among the other things she does, she says, uh, the cities that we've inherited in the 21st century, she doesn't say that. Well, maybe she did say it. She died like seven years ago now. Um, but basically, I'll use my voice. The cities we've inherited in the 21st century are the outcome of the powerful assertion of, in diagrammatic form of emerging of these three ideas, the city beautiful, the garden city, and the radiant city as codified in the Athens Charter. Does that make sense? And so it's Jane Jacobs, her critique in the introduction to this book that gives us this term. This is her ridicule of a century of planning. Radiant Garden City Beautiful. It's this agglomeration of three distinct ideas that we spend three different weeks on it. But because we're reading Jane Jacobs first, because we're going back in history, we can be more critical in what we spend our precious time focusing on. We don't, if we, if we invest a huge amount of effort in understanding the city beautiful, the garden cities, the radiant city, we are at risk of simply reproducing those diagrams as we move forward. We're, we're already at risk of just reproducing the problems that we experience because it's normal. It's become normal. And the first job of your generation is to wake up and realize that none of this should ever be normal. It is uh, a mistake and it's a, a violation of your professional ethical obligations to simply uncritically reproduce the Radiant Garden City Group. So we're starting from the future and the present, and we're moving back in time with the critical attitude Armed with this critical attitude, we can now be, we can critically study these and learn what we can learn specifically to help us do something better. Does that make sense? So if that's what we're doing here, and if these are the target questions, are they written large enough for you to even see? <laughs> <clears throat> so, do your target questions align with any of these target questions? Do you have suggestions to make or additions to make to make these target questions work better? Do you have a target question that is really not covered by anything at the eight o'clock group? Covered. Let's complete this list. I feel like uh, I maybe as new at the I said, what's the process of proposing large scale urban design issues and how are they? Yeah, I, I struggled with the word conquer. I didn't want to be polite. I mean, you know, I didn't want to just say influence because, you know, the world. We, we don't have time to be polite. We need to replace urban planning.
and actually architecture how about that Did that how, how do you feel about that well <clears throat> if we take Corbusier's kind of definition of urban urbanism it's clear that like our urban planning hasn't historically lived up to what it is intention so I guess it makes sense but I think anyone else would look at that question and the intention of urbanism is to be holistic. Urban planning, uh, as it's been implemented, boils down <coughs> to the separation of functions connected by uh, high-speed motorways for cars. And that, so that's the urban planning uh, is kind of the, the specialization of urban planning that seems to err on the side of functional plan. Maybe just to be clear, functional, which I'm gathering some of the ideas of functional planning over here in this column. So we're trying to really displace the domination of the built environment as a product of functional planning, separation of functions, and uh, serving the needs of the automobile exclusively. Does that work? I'm, I'm like pumping. I'm like taking advantage of your question and pumping it up. I would like this. I just want that question to be specific to okay. what, what are the what are the practical ways to actually how can the practice of architecture? Negotiate this shift? Yeah. Okay, good question. Others? Well, I don't know all about materials. Okay, that's not up here yet. Yeah, so I said, uh, how can we preserve materials to a better degree without taking away from a new project and still respecting the existing? So what are the two goals? One is respecting what's there. Yep, and then still adding to the project, like not taking away from the new project. Serve so new, new purposes. That's a good one. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to relate to hierarchy and not allow certain parts of cities to like be undesirable. Well, using fire. I don't know. Yeah. Um, How to bring benefits to parts of the city that are lacking those benefits without displacing the people who currently live there. And, uh, so the word hierarchy. So bring all parts of the city into the hierarchy. Don't allow the lower part to kind of. Yeah, bring dignity to those areas that are lacking. Bring dignity to the historically underserved. Yeah, when you find yourself uh, wanting to use the term lower class, it, it's kind of a turnoff. 
uh, in the professional context that we're operating in. The historically underserved, uh, on the other hand, is something that implies right from the start that everybody has a right to the city. And as a matter of fact, that's a fundamental vocabulary term that I'm going to add here. Right to the city. And there's even legislation that's written into the Constitution of Brazil that grants every citizen of the country of Brazil the right to the city, which basically says if you're a uh, resident of Brazil, you get school, you get health, you have a right to affordable housing, you have a right to mobility, you have a right to all of these things that we associate with contemporary life. We, we, we the government is obligated to extend those uh, collective services to every community in the country. It's a cool idea. It's a very fundamental idea that uh, presents a challenge to us moving into the 21st century. So other things, other target questions. Someone's paying a quarter million dollars for education. We have two hours together. How do you get your money's worth? You did all this reading. Go ahead now. Um, for the one we were just talking about, wouldn't you want to, it's like you basically want to do it without identifying their space, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you, like, if you putting in like a new like transportation system, how do you like recommend doing that then? Because like it'd be like, I don't know how I'm trying to word this, but like if you're putting in something that's going to cost a lot of money, aren't they going to have to pay for that somehow? Um, good question. And if it, I mean, yeah, just because if they are like a lower, I don't want to say lower, but transportation, so, yeah, uh, yeah, part of the benefits. And I'm not going to answer it. Maybe I'll answer yeah, it here. Yeah. But maybe I won't. Um, but that is the question. Yeah. Um, when rich people get uh, good schools and good transportation, they deserve it. When poor people get good transportation and good schools and good services, it's a handout and it's a sign of a problem. That's a fundamental attitude that uh, is being countered by the right to the city. And we, we back, in, back in the 1920s, we in the United States, we had no problem with this. We invented this thing called electricity. And we ran electrical wires to the rich people in cities, and it cost you know five dollars per household. The government paid for it. And then during the New Deal, Roosevelt and uh, the Rural Electrification uh, Agency, uh, Congress passed a law and said every American has a right to affordable electrical service and phone service. There used to be. Phones used to be this thing that hung on the wall and had a, what do you call it? A wire. And the wires went from house to house. So phone service and uh, electricity and high-speed internet. No, wait, there was no high-speed internet. But the first two things, uh, even if it cost $10,000 to string a wire to someone's farm way out in the middle of nowhere, the government paid for that. The person who uh, had the person who had cost a thousand dollars to connect their house, and the person who cost a dollar to connect their house, they both got their houses connected for free, regardless of the cost, regardless of whether we thought they were they deserved it or whether they were losers. Everybody got electricity. That was the attitude. That was the American way. It's very alien. It's a foreign country to us now. Losers don't deserve services is the new attitude. Um, if, if a private company can make money by providing high-speed internet to people, then they do it. If they can't make money providing high-speed internet to people, they don't do it. If you want high-speed internet, move. Tough luck, free market, baby. Welcome to America, right? So that's just to focus the question. Any other questions? It deserve attention. You did all that sketch writing, you did all that reading, you wrote your target question. 
by not offering it, you're saying my target question isn't worthy or it's already up there. Is your target question worthy? I think it is. Let's get a few more. No? I have more. Sure. All right. How do we determine the value of something between two groups of people? What does that mean? So when you're doing materials, like you're going to have people who, like, you know how the trees, like say the trees, you have one person who's a developer who doesn't value that tree as much as someone who wants to be there and change themselves to a tree. Yeah. I'm, I live that every day. I'm, I'm going to struggle with my condo association. It's, uh, feels comfortable breaking the law, cutting down trees in Cambridge, but you can't cut down a tree in Cambridge. You can't? No, not without a permit. I know, right? It's a bunch of commies. Well, yeah, I, live in, like I live in a communist community called Cohasson in a communist city called Cambridge. And there are laws against cutting down trees in my commune and in my city. And still the fascists on the board say, we don't like this tree, we're cutting it down. What about homeowner associations? Like, is, communists. Is there, I know, but is, I've, oh, I've never seen one, I've never interacted with one. Are they in Massachusetts? Oh yeah, they're everywhere. There's one there, there's one there. There's at least two out the window. But like- They're everywhere. I'm not, I'm not talking about like that kind of, like I'm talking about like if that had a homeowner association. Yeah. Like a really suburb. This is, yeah, like, like a suburb yeah. community type thing. This is Radburn, New Jersey, built in 1929. They have a homeowners association. And uh, a lot of suburban communities, especially uh, if you let your lawn uh, grow to like two and a half, three inches, you're going to get a phone call. I was watching a TikTok and some guy had a street lamp. It was like too dim. It's like front post. So yeah. they made him get a brighter bulb. Yep. Welcome. It's, it's like crazy. Yeah. So I'm just altering, you know, there's all kinds of things where we're balancing values and we're negotiating uh, the built environment. And I, again, and especially in a commune, you're constantly negotiated, negotiating with your communist neighbors on every little thing. The built environment is a point of social negotiation. It is part of negotiating a better future uh, to engage over the built environment. Every detail, every feature, the length of the grass, the dimness of the bulb, uh, whether it's a gate, whether it's how high is the fence, whether your house is painted the right colors. That's crazy. It's crazy. But it's welcome to the world. It's all social pressures that are, the, the built environment is not separate from the social world. The built environment is a vehicle for negotiating social norms and values. And that's a good thing and it's a horrible thing. Some days it's great, some days it's a nightmare. But that's our job. We get involved uh, to help where there's, especially, this is why our clients call us in. When you have a clearly impossible negotiation where I want this tree, I'm chaining myself to this tree. We have to cut this tree down. Uh, uh, we're gonna call the police on you. That's when they call the architects. And the architects are supposed to take an impossible situation with no resolution and imagine a possibility in which those two seemingly impossible conflicting uh, opposing forces can be resolved. And that's why in thesis, when you get to thesis, uh, we're gonna, you're gonna propose a thesis and we're gonna say, that's not a thesis. And one of the tests of a good thesis is if you explain it to your mother, and your mother says, well, that's impossible. When your mother says that's impossible, then you've got a thesis, <laughs> right? It's the mother test for your thesis. Because it's these two things you're trying to satisfy are impossible to satisfy, whether it's the material heritage 
are the landscape features. These are these things can't be resolved until you call in the architect and they figure out a way. Well, there's this third possibility, and ching, you get the commission, you pay off your student loans, and you live happily ever after. Good question. Any more? So I don't know if Nick's uh, paraphrasing of the uh, introduction covers it, but um, one of the things covered in the introduction to this book is that Jane Jacobs is saying this diagram has been baked into the professions of architecture, urban design, and urban planning. Uh, it's almost like she makes an analogy. It's like the doctors who study bloodletting. So if you put a leech on, if you're suffering from hysteria, you put a leech on this part, on this vein, and the leech will suck the blood from this vein, and that will treat hysteria. If you're suffering from constipation, you put the leech on this vein, and you will be cured. So it's this, she makes the analogy that uh, architecture, urban design, and urban planning are the victims of their own specialized knowledge. They study it very carefully in great depth in a, in a way that is totally not based on reality. This is totally made up. And so we send our, our young professionals off to these professional schools. They study how to do this very well. They get A's in bloodletting. And then they are unleashed on the world and they destroy the world uh, based on these principles that have no basis in reality. And she says, stop trusting your teachers. Stop trusting the diagrammatic assertions of your professional education. Start opening your eyes, look at the world for yourself and figure it out for real. That's the manifesto upon which the analysis assignment is based. Choose a piece of the conclusion of this lecture. I, your professor, number four, will have finished the process of establishing the foundation and released you into the world. Your job, should you choose to accept it, is to find a place in the world that you think you can learn from, especially if it's a positive example. There's lots of stuff to critique. That's my job. I'll lay the foundation by critiquing the hell out of these things in this lecture. Jane Jacobs is critiquing the hell out of things. The Athens Charter is full of cartoonish ideas that are worth critiquing. Okay, we're done with the critiquing. Your job as design professionals is to produce, create, design, bring into the world positive examples that resolve the conflicts inherent in all of this, beyond the length of the glass, or the grass, or the brightness of the bulb. It's to solve these problems that would otherwise appear impossible. That's why they call the architects. So that's, that's what we're doing. This, the introduction to this book, is a manifesto upon which this course is based. Okay, questions? Okay. Now everybody close their laptops because I had the distinct feeling on Monday that I was that annoying student in the studio that just keeps talking when someone's trying to, everyone's trying to do their studio work. And that annoying guy keeps talking to us. Like, so I'm going to have to go work at home. You don't want to take notes. If you're taking notes, thank you. You can continue. Okay. I am recording. I have Vavica. I have Laurel and I have Robbie. Do any of the three of you have any uh, target questions to recommend? Why was the answer? Or, 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 or
Laurel's. Right. Laurel's there. Yeah. <laughs> I, speak up. Uh, I don't have anything to say. Try now. <laughs> wow. Okay, we hear you now. Have any target questions for us? Are you asking me? Yeah. Um, I wrote, what has been done today to reverse segregation in city housing? I don't know if that has to do with anything. What has been done to reverse segregation? Racial segregation, class segregation, both? Thank you, Laurel. You're welcome. Uh, Robbie, Babaka, anything? They're not really there. I have one. Okay, Robbie. All right. Is the responsibility of preserving the natural world in the urban landscape devoted strictly to architects and planners, or is this a matter for every member of community to support efforts in revitalizing cities? Well, you kind of, the way you ask it, it's kind of got an answer built in, right? Yeah, I see that. <laughs> Can you ask us a harder question? How, how are architects supposed to drive this bus to help society generally negotiate these difficult Questions of value. Yeah, I like that. How can, well, it's kind of like um, Ryan's question. How can we negotiate? Um, designs that balance conflicting values, conflicting goals. Conflicting views. Right. Good question. Vabika, you got one? She was talking a little while. I can't really see the board, so I don't know if it's already been brought up. But um, how can we create solutions for such large scale issues such as reorganizing cities? Is it a realistic and attainable goal? Yeah, I think that's covered. Okay. The, the organizing of cities. Um, the way it's written here, how can urbanism, used to say architecture, but how can architecture slash urbanism replace, conquer, displace functional planning in organizing our cities. Especially, is there something specifically that we can do in practice? What practices can we employ uh, to help do the, achieve this? Does that sound good? I think, I think she said yes. Okay. So any questions before we launch in? So let's start with the world. Do you recognize this? Nope. So um, the Radiant Garden City Beautiful is imprinted in, in the world all around us. And uh, the key principle that guides the, the thread that cuts through this whole topic is the human scale. What is the human scale experience, especially 
for the most vulnerable users of our book. Okay, so it's, let's set up the scenario. It's 9.30 at night. No, it's 10 at night. Uh, and you're coming home from someplace and you're going to your dorm. Where do, where do you live? Is this a one? No, that's a one. You, let's, say, let's say you're going home to your dorm and it's over here. It's one of these. What are those called? Uh, no, that's not safe. Triple six, uh, six, six, uh, six ten and eight. Six ten and eight. Let's say let's say six six ten. Six ten? Yeah. Okay. So you're coming home and you're um and it's ten o'clock at night and oh wait, the most important part, men. It's time for you to exercise the number one uh, ethical requirement of the design professions, and that is exercise empathy. If you're a guy, you just go, right? Even in this neighborhood. But what if you're a woman? What if you're a freshman, a freshman woman coming back late at night from Ruggles? What's the shortest path? to get to 610. Right, you come out, and you go through here, right? That's your path, right? That's the shortest path. Do you go that way? Why not? Get a lot of shots fired on the street. <laughs> shots fired notifications on the street. So uh, this is, we're doing the pepper spray test, right? Your parents care about you, you're smart, you carry the pepper spray they gave you, it's on your keychain, right? And, um, and so you go this way. Why? Because William Ron, the architect, designed West Village according to the principles of human scale experience. He created a series of outdoor rooms and he made lots of eyes on the street and this is the safe route. So let's gauge um, how safe do you feel when you're walking through here? Women, you're all women. You feel safe? You feel safe-ish? Yeah. Okay, now you turn left and you're walking on the annex side of the street. How does it feel? Not bad. Okay, now you're walking you across and you're walking on the field side of the street. Is it better or worse? Worse because you're in an actual parking lot and is there a game going on at 10? No, it's pretty empty. It's kind of dark. It feels worse, right? Okay, if you get here, you cross the street. How does this feel? Not great. Not great. Thank you for the decorative lawn, but no thanks. It doesn't really help me feel safe. How about if you're on the Orthodox Church side? Does it feel okay? Better. Better, but why? Because they put a fence across. Do you see it? They put a fence there. And it's not an evangelical church, so there's no Bible study on Wednesday night. There's no Saturday night thing. It's just like Sunday morning and funerals, and that's it. That nobody's ever there. So it's kind of dead here too. So we're not doing so well. We were doing fine over here. We're not doing so well. Okay, let's go back to the Sweeney Field side of the street. We go in here. How's this feel? Not great. Why? Parking. You're also not surrounded by any like residents. Like there's no housing, so there's no like eyes on the street. Right. You go Watson Hall. You love Watson Hall, right? Windows. There's no one there, and if, even if some, even if there was a a rock concert going on, even if there were a thousand people in Watson Hall, it doesn't matter. There's no window. 
Here we go. When you did your tour, when you were in high school and you toured, there was a tennis court here, right? Do you remember that? You weren't here for tennis courts. Oh, uh, okay. Tennis courts are gone. And here's wine cell we'll put in this thing. How are we doing here? Feel better or worse? Women, you're all women. How do you feel walking in? Like it's better because it's all the ways like at the top. Yeah, it's better, right? Even though no one's in there, someone could be in there. Right? So it feels safer. How are we feeling here? Pretty good right here. Right? Crosswalk. If there's any traffic at all, then this way. Now, let's say I was going somewhere, I was going to visit my friend on Michigan. I'm walking here by cancer. How, how are we doing? Not so great. Okay. Not so great. So this is the product of the Radiant Garden City. Beautiful. This is the landscape that we're inheriting that uh, my generation is bequeathing on your generation. Uh, you need to be sensitive. Uh, you need to have the, the pepper spray test constantly in mind as you walk through the world. And because you're gonna be asked to do things to change this. Um, so what do we do? That's what this, first of all, how do we get here? How did the principles of these different diagrammatic ideas uh, result in this, this world that we live in? Okay, so that's, the, that's my target question for this lecture, but I think, helps to organize and structure these topics. How does that sound? Let's see how it goes. So pepper spray test, how does this building do? So what's wrong? Let's quickly make a list. We gotta move quickly. So just rattle it up. What's wrong? No windows. What else? Not a lot of people. What else? Uh, monolithic. Monolithic. What else? This is how people come and go. They drive under the building, they get out of their cars and go in. And when they come out, they go the same way. So that's part of the reason why it's so empty. Even though it's Pasadena, it's pretty bad. So this plaza out front, this decorative plaza, these decorative planters, the fentanyl addicts, this is where we love to hide. You can see how I switched perspective there? I was a young woman, now I'm a fentanyl addict. See, see how that's that? a crazy progression through life. Right? This is what architects are asked to do. So as a fentanyl addict, this is where I, I attack people. I hide here. And uh, I didn't make a true thing that's what they hide. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was like in the government center, they'll hide. They're not, they're not hiding. They sit all, they'll sit along the bench right there and like they'll throw quarters and be like, hey, you pick up that quarter for me and the chest. Okay. Sounds, sounds, I would do that here. You could. I mean, you're but a fentanyl I'm, addict. So. But I'm an American, so of course I have a gun. And now that it's illegal to prevent me, I'm going to conceal carry my gun uh, because I have the right to. And so this becomes a lot more dangerous in that context. So it's a complex of the built environment and the social arrangements of uh, society. But um, you can tell there's a parking lot below this plaza. You know this roof is going to leak and you're going to have to jack him. And him. Um, you know this parking lot because of these ventilator grates. Uh, plus, this has. You know, 300 employees, that means 300 cars, 400, uh, three, 300 square feet per employee stacked up for the office space, 450 square feet for each car. You can't stack it. It's very expensive to stack it. Maybe it's two levels. So you know the entire site is filled with parking for 300 cars to fit the 300 employees in this building. So that's how we got here. And this is what we do as architects. We produce these monstrosities that make the world unsafe 
where maybe we're serving, maybe we think Bank of America, maybe we took this job thinking, I'm just the architect. I have no choice. As an architect, I do what the client wants us to do. End of story. And if, if it produces a dangerous situation, if uh, decades from now, my best friend's daughter is assaulted here, uh, and my best friend remembers that I worked on this project, oh, let's say, what am I going to say to my best friend? I just, I just did what the client asked you to do. That's what architects do. Or is it? The, the situation where the architects just do what the clients ask to do is not the best idea. For example, Wentworth is notoriously bad as a client. Wentworth is stingy and uh, kind of myopic, narrow-minded. Wentworth wishes that it had a campus out in the suburbs. Wentworth tried to move its campus to the suburbs. Wentworth is constantly denying the fact that we live in one of the greatest locations for a university in the world. Wentworth resents the city of Boston around it. And it comes out every time we do a master plan. Uh, they ask the architects to just ignore the city around it. When Lear's, Lear, Lear's Wine Sample uh, was, got commissioned to turn the tennis court into an uh, engineering building, uh, they, were, they were told, cut corners, make it cheap. We don't want corridors and useless service spaces. We want to minimize that. We don't want gathering places. We don't want all these fluffy programs. We want classrooms and laboratories and offices. We want the highest return on investment. Tom Chong, who teaches here, brilliantly jujitsu that whole situation and made every corridor into a social gathering place. And every social gathering place is a corridor. When is a corridor better than, uh, better than just a corridor? When it's also a social space. When is a social space better than when it's just a social space, when it's also a corridor. I used to teach that architects can only do as well as their clients allow them to do. That architects are limited by the vision of their clients, that you have to educate your clients in order to produce good architecture. Um, but now I can't say that anymore. God damn you, Tom Trump, I have to change the way I teach. Now, because of Tom, I have to say, architects need to do more than what their clients would like them to do. And this brings us back to the long, venerable tradition of architecture. Hopefully, someday, we will be able to look back on the history of architecture and say, it, the profession of architecture has always been responsible for producing the most positive public realm uh, that they can make. And that the needs of the clients to serve their purposes of the clients inside the building uh, and in other ways are secondary to that larger public social good. I would like to be able to teach that I would like to be able to say with confidence and teach with confidence that that's the way it has always been, except there was a brief moment after World War II when architects imagined that all they had to do was satisfy the needs of their client and they really had no obligation to anybody else. But because of projects like Tom's at Lear's Wine Sample, I can now start to connect the dots between what we must do in the 21st century and what we have always done. Where am I going? What we have always done throughout the history of architecture is we co create with the other buildings, we, we co produce the public realm in response to, in reaction to, it's like a chess game where 
history has produced all these buildings. And now my job is to add to that ensemble in a way that completes it in a most positive way possible, while also satisfying the direct, explicit, programmatic needs of my client. I have to do both. And that is at the core of the ethics of the architectural profession. This is unethical and should never happen again. So uh, throughout the history of architecture, architects have produced these outdoor rooms. The first item on our vocabulary list for human scale architecture. When we study uh, this moment in history, we don't even know what this building is. We don't know what it's like inside. We don't care. The reason we study this is because Michelangelo produced this remarkable outdoor room. We do study this, right? We studied the interior of this. Um, Michelangelo designed a dome uh, for St. Peter's in Rome, um, but then he handed it off to someone else. Anyway, we study this, uh, but this is more important. This is uh, the Pope is giving the Sunday blessing to Catholics all around the world. This is the Vatican, right? This is the Vatican. My girlfriend was there like two weeks ago and she said there's so many homeless people there. And it's like the saddest thing she's ever seen. It's like the Vatican's a wicked rich. There's gold everywhere. And then she, the amount of homeless people just lining the sides of each and every building is insane. Well, if I were homeless, see what I just did? Yeah. I would go here. Because it's outdoors and shelter. Yeah, that's, that's where she said they were going. Yeah, yeah, and maybe I form a a collective, and we'd hire architects and figure out how to solve the problem. Another thing about homelessness it doesn't like it doesn't make sense to me. If I was homeless, like I would go. Well, down see south. what he just did. Okay, go on. I would go down south where it's warm all year round. Like I don't, I don't understand. Like you're homeless, right? So like, what what do you have here that's keeping you here? I, I never understood that. So why don't you go down south where it's warm? Yes, it's going to take a while because you don't have internet transportation but see what he's doing there what what are you what about your family your church your old job so like well, well just because i'm homeless doesn't mean i don't have a family a church you can't go hang out with your family for a little while you can't go hang out with the church okay. yeah but our relationship is extremely strange all right so then they're not keeping you here let's, let's go down south i know but I, you know my sister my 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 daughter well, think about it if you messed up so many times in your life that your family is willing to let you stay homeless mm -hmm. The fuck them going south. Like, think about it that way. Yeah, but it's not just about them. It's about me. I I, I don't want to give up on myself. I don't want them to give up on me. Well, the further, but the further away from home I go, the more vulnerable I am to becoming further victimized by other homeless people. That makes sense. No, I get that. You know, so, homeless cheaper south in the south. The homeless people that I hang out with, they're horrible. God, they're not. These are not people I want to. Well, they're raised on the streets, go on the streets. Right. But go to California. Right? It's warm there. I go to Florida. It's cheaper, it's warmer. It's a lot of old people well, that are nice to you. California, there's more social services. Really? Yeah, it's more of a democratic like state. People, well, a little judgmental on that. Well, <laughs> why hold back? We're talking about homeless people. Yeah, right. So, um, so speaking of homelessness, these are the indoor public spaces. I'm going to Rome. I'm not going to hang out the Vatican. I'm going to hang out in these churches. And when I get kicked out of this church, I'm going to go to this church. When I get kicked out of that church, look okay, at it's like a map of homeless shelters. Do they not have like a South Station they can just hang out in? And it's nothing but all the there. yellow words. No. It's nothing but South Station. What about a downtown crossing? It's nothing but downtown crossings. <laughs> this is. The Noli map is the map of the indoor public realm. It's homeless heaven. Copenhagen. So this is uh, a method of drawing. Sometimes we see vivid demonstrations of the values and principles of architecture embedded in the tools of representation. Embedded in this tool of representation is an understanding that there's the outdoor public realm, there's the indoor private realm, and there's a third thing in between. It's in the indoor public realm. 
This is the Noli map. It's a figure ground. You've done figure grounds. You probably did a figure ground of your current project, right? Project site. Well, don't just do a figure ground that shows public and private. Show that third thing, the indoor public realm, because this is where the life of the city moves in and out of buildings, and where it hardly matters whether you're inside or outside, which is hopefully uh, one of the things you are producing in your design is that um, the public is welcome inside. Like, what's the program? A makerspace. A makerspace. What's better than a makerspace that uh, uh, keeps people out unless you pay the fee? A makerspace that welcomes people in, right? There's no guard at the front that even Ryan, when he's homeless. When, <laughs> excuse me. We're all homeless. We're all this close. This is the United States, my friend. Yeah, we all are. Very We're all. It's like one, one, one bad decision away. I, I yeah. yeah okay. one, one wrong step and it's game over. Right, right. So keep that in mind. Where's your, how's your health insurance? Oh. United States? Oh, I'm sorry. Your health insurance is tied to your employment. You, your boss is abusing your relationship. They're harassing you. It's a toxic environment. It's bad for me. I can't pay off my student loans. Uh, but I can't leave. Why can't you leave? Health insurance. With, if you were like do a map like this, mm -hmm. uh, is this in public information you can get? Like, wanted to do this for a role, for example, you yeah. get them. You have to do some guesses. Um, the starting point would be the Sanborn maps from the most recent Sanborn maps, I think, are in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So start with Sanborn maps and then walk around low uh, mm -hmm. and add the new, use Google Earth, use SketchUp, and add the new buildings since 1960, and then identify which ones are churches and open public lobbies that are not locked. Mm -hmm. And then that's what we do. And that's basically what this exercise was. Wealth increase uh, for 15 years, top the urban studio. And I'm sorry you don't get this. Uh, I'm sorry you don't get to take the urban studio. Wealth increase taught this for 15 years. The first six weeks is uh, identify a really good street. And these books should be circulating. Um, because the Boulevard book, especially street books, it sends around. Take a look at some of the drawings. But Weldon's uh, approach to drawing urban landscapes as it were architecture, this takes the Noli plan and puts it on a whole new level. And so this is a public realm that is drawn like an architecture project. It's a street drawn like architecture. And you see in this the root principles of our analysis assignment. You see selective depiction. You see, uh, we see the context of Copenhagen, but it fades into the background. And our attention is drawn to where the line weight draws our attention, to where the detail brings our attention. Johan and Boyle. So do you, hopefully you recognize the idea embedded in this method of drawing as being, because my challenge, when I was hired, uh, people who hired me here at Wentworth said, you gotta help out this old guy in Weldon. He insists that the students draw everything by hand. You're young, you're from MIT, you, you're savvy, you're technically savvy um, until, uh, Google Slides proved that I was not. Um, can you please help Weldon get over the fixation with the pencil? We need to use AutoCAD or something to, to make these drawings. And so I went in, I was going to convert Weldon into a digital uh, architect, but he convinced me that this is the right way to do it. 
I bet there's a way to do this digitally now. Actually, Weldon started doing it digitally when he did the Istanbul studio. But there's something very powerful about the six week experience of drawing these drawings. So the street as architecture is that the first thing here. Uh, that we're getting back to this idea that architects designing the public realm and taking responsibility for the spaces between buildings, which is the name of one of these books going on. Um, so keep that in mind. Now we're going to very quickly zoom through uh, what used to be studied as a separate topic each week. The City Beautiful Movement. It shouldn't say 1493. It should say 1893. Sorry about that. So who's Catholic? Who was raised Catholic? So do you know about this place called Purgatory? We go after death? No? Not just here? Yeah, isn't it just hell? Yeah. Yes. No. It's, it's the Purgatory. It's before hell. It's before hell. Well, let's, before let's stay optimistic. It's before <laughs> heaven for you guys, right? So it's like a waiting room? It's a, it's a yeah. limbo. Yeah. It's limbo. Did you grab a ticket? Did you grab a ticket? Wait, wait in line. Like exactly. And it turns out that if you go on pilgrimages, if you visit holy sites throughout the Christian world, you get indulgences. Indulgences are like frequent flyer miles. You can reduce your time in purgatory. And so when the Pope needed to raise a lot of money for the churches that we study in this, in this program. Um, he declares a jubilee year and you get double bonus purgatory indulgence points. Uh, it's like a 200% bonus. It's like a new credit card. You get frequent flyer miles. It's the same thing, only you can reduce your time in purgatory. Um, you can also later, you could donate money straight to the Pope, and you would get indulgences. The trick is, no, how long how long are we supposed to wait in purgatory? No one knows. So how many years, uh, how many indulgences, how many years of indulgences do we need? Uh, no one knows. Is a thousand enough? Is two thousand enough? No one knows. So there's never enough indulgences. So there, there was an incentive bonus program to visit Rome in the Jubilee year. And they made this diagram of visual corridors, visual connections between the seven holy sites of Rome. And once the diagram was produced, once the idea of the diagram was there, they built it into the city of Rome. And so these visual corridors were cut through the fabrics of Rome in order to visually connect the seven holy sites of Rome. Cool, right? So this gives us a sense that the, the human scale, the human scale that was involved in this was the scale of sight. This, this uh, tilting of the walls is called force of perspective. We studied it in history theory too. Both of these are using force of perspective to uh, create an optical illusion of a larger scale monument at the end of the visual corridor. So each of these end of visual corridor appears to be much larger because of the forced perspective. Is that cool? So the, the human scale of this has to do with the visual scale. The, the sense of taste is very low. Sense of touch is a distance of zero. The sense of smell about this far. Sense of hearing about the size of the room. The scale of human scale of walking, half mile, but the scale of sight is big. So the human scale that's connected to this part of, of uh, the design of the built environment is this, the human scale of the sense of sight. It, so this is a visual, a visual experiment experience. The human experience here is a visual human experience. Versailles, we studied that. Paris is all about the long axial visual corridors. 
This is Baroque city planning. Some would call it mannerism. Uh, it became the basis for what later became known as the city beautiful movement. These long visual corridors with monumental architecture at the end. Uh, Hausmann's transformation of Paris was partly about moving troops through wide boulevards. So there's a resonance between the wide boulevards for troop movement, wide boulevards for wiping out uh, the neighborhoods of people uh, we don't like in our city. Long before uh, the US invented redlining and race segregation, um, Paris had the clearing of the slums through wide boulevards. Uh, the boulevards become this area for just uh, parading and displaying the wealth and a place to locate monumental architecture at the end of these visual corridors. Cutting the boulevards through the slums, creating this pattern for Paris and the region around Paris, reaching all the way to Versailles. Uh, these visual, so the entire region is structured through these visual corridors. Yes. Um, so, when you have these spaces, um, like going and talking about and feeling safe as you're walking through the spaces, mm -hmm. um, like the northeastern buildings, and even the, the ones that are kind of warm and close, like open spaces. Do I have to show my Northeastern ID when I pass? Uh, I'm homeless. Okay, we're all homeless. Why not go hang out here? There's chairs that make it very comfortable to hang out there. Why don't you hang out here as a homeless person? Brian's ahead of us. I'm already going to plan down. So, why, Brian, why don't you hang out here? Uh, Surprisingly enough, I do find myself there more often than most. But what if uh, you need a bath? If I need a bath, then the, the, the Charles is a good place to go. I know, but what if you stink and you're hanging out here? Well, then the, yeah, the reflecting pond up there, you go there like after like 2 a.m., you won't get bothered it's quick. No, you stink. You yeah. You're not taking a bath. You're homeless. So I'm going to fix my stink. Okay, anyone else? Why don't... <laughs> Why don't we hang out here as, as when we're homeless? Campus security. Campus security is yeah. gonna identify us as being homeless. That's obvious. They're all around the area too. Right? But even before the campus police get there, we have empathy for the other users. I feel bad about my appearance. I feel bad about myself. I feel bad about my impact on the people around me. I, I feel humiliated every time uh, a mother gathers her daughter to her side and, and walks around to avoid me. It makes me feel horrible. I don't want to go hang out here. It's just more humiliation. I'd rather hop over the fence and hang out on the front steps of the church because no one's going to bother me because no one's there. I'd rather hang out over here on this lawn until, what's your name? From one security, what's her name? Sarah? She comes over and she'll tell me to move on. Or there's lots of places where people are not going to bother me. Right? But here, even before campus security comes, it's, it's awkward socially. Did you see that? It's awkward socially. So I don't hang out there as a homeless person. Do you buy that? Yeah. So, what word? Buildings, a homeless person is more likely to hang out in the front steps versus in the back. Yeah. Wide area. Yeah. Places that are abandoned. Well, and because that's an open space. So I'm saying if you have open spaces, is it better to have them be closed? Like, I 
as we talked about earlier, safer? Or are we trying to create open spaces that are actually open and used by everyone? Well, I would say that this is a better scale than this. <laughs> And um, when you get the job of master planning on the campus, actually, you've already been invited to help master plan on the campus. Um, one of the things you could do is take this leftover space that is the legacy of the City Beautiful movement and start to you know, do a sympathetic, similar scale, uh, contextual, but unabashedly modern, contemporary extension that brings these facades out to the street wall so that this becomes safe. This is a dangerous place. Both sides of Ruggles don't fail the pepper spray test because it's so far away from the buildings. There's no, there's no outdoor room created along Ruggles Street. There's nothing here, and there's it's a very weak definition of the outdoor room of Ruggles. So I would extend these buildings out to the street. And maybe I would put something in the corners to anchor the corners and I would certainly obliterate the damn driveway. Yeah. So why does open space fail the pepper spray test? Because wouldn't it be easier to see people? Women? I don't know. It's, it's a job. It's <laughs> But, like, <laughs> when you're there, witness, you're there. There's no, I, like, when you take the quad, for example, like, I feel like more people are onto the in that space rather than the front. Yeah. Okay. They, I think, though, too, that when they build something on their screen, that that might help. Oh, it better. I mean, this is one of the most important sites in. New England. And if they mess this up, oh my God. And what are the chances of them not messing it up? It's pretty low. We're going to mess it up. I just have a quick question for like yeah. you guys again. So I'm a guy, obviously, so I don't think about these things, but. Wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> Never say that again. I'm an architect. Say this I'm an architect, so I struggle. I struggle to understand these things. Yes. If I'm in your shoes and I'm walking home late at night, I think I would rather the street than the quad just because of the fact that the street, there's most likely going to be a car or two there. Yep. So if something were to happen, there's hopefully another person going to be there can see what's going on, hear me screaming, yelling. Right a police car. A police car or something. In the quad, there's it's, it's surrounded by four sides. So God forbid something happened and well, this has probably someone standards. will be there. Yeah, exactly. But and, like, and what's her name? Sarah is in the booth over here. Yeah. And so, but here's the comparison. <clears throat> uh, if I if I need if I'm here, if I'm here and I need to get to here, I don't cut across this lawn. That's I there's no fence. Uh, there's not. I, I take no. the sidewalk. There's no fence. Well, you can get around. There's a there's seven right there. fence. Yeah. You can you can get through here. Um, but I come along the street because there might be a police car. There are people. There are good Samaritans. It's 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 a place where the drug-addled brain of someone who's threatening me. Um, it's it's safer. And still, make sure your pepper spray or your taser is ready. So um, I, I like that we're circling back to this because this is the reality of practice. This is the discussion of your careers. You will be having this discussion. You will be introducing to your colleagues the idea of the pepper spray test. It's a very useful thing. You will be challenging your male colleagues, especially, to have empathy. And male co your male colleagues will be struggling to earn the right to be trusted allies in this long-term struggle to remake the built environment into a series of places where our daughters will be safe.
Where were we? So um, the scale, the scale that's involved in the city beautiful is this very large scale visual scale. At the and sometimes it's compatible with other the other human scales of walking, uh, especially. But sometimes it's not. And we'll see other examples when it's not. But ideally, uh, you are taking care of the visual scale and all the other scales. So in this famous example, uh, when Paris was going through its transformation, uh, they tore down the, the you know the the Marathi hordes of of Islam were finally uh, not a threat anymore, and so. Uh, Vienna tore down its medieval walls and its fields of fire, which is similar to the idea of it's safer when it's open space, right, Ryan? Right? Uh, that you, you, you have to keep the space around your defensive fortress totally empty so there's no place for the enemy to hide and seek shelter so you can kill them before they reach your wall. Right? So um, in 1858, it says, uh, Vienna said, it's time to expand the city uh, into what had been the fields of fire. So this is what it did. It built these monumental buildings with these huge open spaces. Uh, you see the city beautiful scale, the visual scale, the decorative plantings. It's all very pretty from a diagrammatic uh, perspective and from above. It looks very nice, but it's a long ways to walk from here to here. I'm going to get in a carriage because it's too big. And uh, an architect by the name of Camilo Cite said, uh, we can do better than this. We can, uh, in 1889, he published uh, city planning according to artistic principles. The artistic principles had to do with recapturing the human scale. He objected to these vast spaces, and he was using these examples from uh, other towns, especially in Italy and uh, Belgium uh, and other parts of France, that had said that these, these intimate human scale plazas, piazzas, that were much more favorable to human engagement. And so he was proposing uh, redoing this Ringstrasse development according to human scale ideas. Another example that was actually built according to human scale ideas. Sure, there's a lot of visual corridor going on in Barcelona in their extension uh, of the grid outside of the medieval city. Uh, but it wasn't just visual corridors. It was also this brilliant block idea that you have major streets and then smaller streets, and you had a uh, street side of every building, and then you had the garden side of every building. So every apartment has a view to the hustle and bustle of the city and the quiet and sanctuary of the inner block gardens. So there's a human scale at work in the design of the block that assembles together to create a, a very successful human uh, scale city. So the, the, the kind of peak of the City Beautiful movement came uh, when the U.S., wanted to convert its position in the world from this wilderness, uh, vast continent of forests and resources and wealth, and not just to be the young, the nouveau riche, the young wealthy country, it wanted to be respected in the world. So it starts to produce a story about itself as the inheritor of uh, European civilization. And so this American Renaissance idea uh, and one of the key vehicles of this American Renaissance idea is architecture. And one of the P 
peak moments of this rewriting of the story occurs in Chicago, a place that when people left the 1893 uh, World Columbian Exposition, they would go to the, the cattle yards, one of the smelliest places in the world, um, to see all the cows being slaughtered and produced for beef and sent off in uh, rail cars to the rest of the country. Um, so Chicago is struggling to not just be the young, dirty, uh, greedy, wealthy city, it wanted to be civilized. And so this was its ticket to join the club of civilized cities. And this was used to uh, reinforce uh, the United States effort to join the ranks of civilized nations like France and England and uh, et cetera. <clears throat> and this was also during a time when uh, white supremacy was on the rise after the Civil War. Um, so I think you had all this. Um, I think Greg Logan talked to you about the Japanese pavilion, how this influenced Frank Lloyd Wright. Remember that? No? Didn't happen? Who knows? I was working on studio during that class. So um, the, the key, one of the key things about the 1909 Chicago plan is it wasn't just a physical transformation of Chicago, according to these visual corridors, the city beautiful principles, but the visual corridors had this civilizing mission. The job was for the fabric of the city and its monumental architecture at its key nodes that we see down these long uh, corridors, these visual uh, avenues. It's a, a reforming of the society, not just the physical city. So the physical city was part of it, but it wasn't just the physical city. It was also a social contract. So the plan of Chicago, comma, was accompanied by a textbook that was used in a required class. Every high school had to have this class. It was a class in civics. And so as recently as the 1980s, people who went to high school in Chicago used this text period. Textbook, period. So it reinforced, this example reinforces the idea that urban form is a vehicle for social norms and values when you're trying to <clears throat> alter who we are, how we function, what does it mean to be a member of this society? The City Beautiful movement, uh, especially through the work of Daniel Burnham, went through every city in the United States, San Francisco, uh, often the boulevards were ignored and the civic center is the one thing that got uh, done. This is a different civic center than the one that was actually built uh, on Vaness. The civic center of, of uh, San Francisco <coughs> in the end. Because boulevards are difficult. Washington DC is transformed. Uh, Cleveland is a really Good example. This is a photo from Bing Maps. You ever use Bing Maps? Microsoft purchased Bing, so I'm not sure how you would find those. Um, but the key, this, this last city beautiful example is just to make the point that the city beautiful strategy for transformation of the cities is an instrument of power. And it's a very attractive instrument of power to anyone aspiring to gain power. 
In this case, there was a mediocre art student who applied to architecture school and was rejected, was humiliated, and he was pissed off about it. And um, he became kind of a fanatic about the victimization of the German people in World War I, and the rest is history. He became, uh, he was really pissed off. And so what do you do when you're pissed off and you're sick of being humiliated? You take control of the world. And he used design. He was part of the effort to design the Volkswagen Bug. He was part of the effort to design the Autobahn highway system of Germany. He had a hand in the design of the uh, German uniform, uh, the Nazi uh, advertising campaigns, one of the most successful ad campaigns in the 20th century. And he was obsessed with architecture. Architecture was an instrument for transforming Germany to become the most powerful uh, country in history. And it's hard to tell, but each of these buildings, this building was taller than the Empire State Building. If you saw Man in the High Castle, which uh, the storyline of Man in the High Castle is Heisenberg gets to the atomic bomb before uh, the US, the Germans, the Nazis win uh, World War II. Uh, they take over North America, they build this city. And so some of the key scenes in Man in the High Castle take place inside this building having been built. And I used to have a clip from that just to give you a sense of the most extreme version of the city beautiful expression of power is this boulevard that culminates in this massive dome. And it becomes a key strategy for European powers in uh, striking an order, imposing an order on the uh, colonial world here in India, British India. So that's City Beautiful. Questions? Garden cities. <clears throat> Ebenezer Howard was uh, a court stenographer. He was not trained as an architect, but he was very critical of London. And he joined, he was uh, kind of a visionary and he was very bold. And he said, why don't we take the best parts of the city and the best parts of the contact with nature and bring it together into a city country, a town country and get the best of both worlds. And so he created a diagram, again, at this huge scale dominated by visual axes. And each of these things was a city. It was very high density, tall buildings uh, uh, limited to these locations connected by rail transportation and a canal uh, and some roads, but mainly separated by these buffer green belts, these agricultural lands, these relief from the density of the city. Uh, that is one of the things that actually got built when the green belt uh, new towns of England are created. And that's what we see here is uh, a green belt of preserved uh, agricultural land outside of the town and these large blocks where the houses are gathered next to the, the streets, the tree-lined streets, so that behind each house there's a garden. And if I were suggesting improvements here, I would make a distinction between the private gardens of each household and the shared tree wilderness enclave center of each of these blocks. And so this is the garden city idea as it evolves from the diagram that Ebenezer Howard uh, produced uh, around the same time as the Chicago White City uh, exposition. 
And these ideas have grown into uh, what is now suburban sprawl. The garden city became a garden town, became a garden village, uh, and the density went down uh, in each chapter, in each one of these things. But it has the benefit of being human scale. This half mile radius is walking distance. If you grew up a half mile to your school, uh, chances are you would walk to school. But unfortunately, schools a half mile from homes became illegal in the 60s, so you didn't grow up half mile from school like that. You did? Where was that? Montville, New Jersey. What was it? New Jersey. Where in New Jersey? Northern New Jersey. What's the town? Montville. Montville. Across the street. Excellent. So that's that was the ideal. And this is um, an idea that was in, that was built in Radburn, New Jersey not even close to Montville. And so in Radburn, New Jersey, in 1929, these ideas were built, I'm sorry, this is so resolution, so low resolution, but every house had a driveway on one side that connected to the streets that brought the man to his workplace, uh, maybe in the city. And then had a, on the other side of the house, it had a female side, it's 1929. Uh, and so on the female side of the house, there's no car, there's no driveway, there's a pedestrian environment. And so on the female side, there's gardens and trees and fields and grass and pathways that connect. So here's the, here's the street, the street network, and here's the pedestrian network in the center of that block. And the most vulnerable users were identified in the design process as children. So the test was, uh, how do we design this so that my seven-year-old daughter can leave the house in the morning and walk to school on her own or with her friends? And so that's what drove this design. When it came time to cross the street, it's safer if we just make an underpass. So they don't have to cross the street, they can go under the street. Because the automobile is the greatest threat to the most vulnerable uh, inhabitants of our town. And so this, because the automobile was coming into prominence in 1929, this is the solution. It's kind of brilliant. It's and, sort of interesting because I don't always think of an underpass as the safest place to be. Well, you have to design it well. <clears throat> You have to design it. There was a horrible, who lives in Porter Square? It's eight o'clock. Uh, the eight o'clock show, I think Daniel is in the summer room. But there's an underpass under their uh, rail that I used to carry this huge double stroller down the steps. I'd go under the railroad and then carry it up the steps and take, take my kids to the playground. Uh, and then they spent like $10 million and they made this beautiful ramp, artwork, patrol cars can go through this ramp. All of a sudden it's safe, even though it's adjacent to poor people in public housing, right? Ah, but no problem. No problem. So it's possible to do it. The other way to do it is through zoning. And this is planting the seed, uh, the son of Charles Garnier, the architect of the Paris Opera House. He won the Rome Prize instead of going to Rome and sketching the grand old antiquities of Rome. He used his Rome Prize to explore the idea of an industrial city where uh, the industrial procedures would occur outside of the town, the infrastructure zone, the river would separate would be, uh, sep would be the separator between the industrial side of the city and the new town where people live. And so zoning, he was one of the promoters of zoning that was then picked up uh, by white supremacy in the United States. Zoning became a very powerful instrument for producing uh, the segregated reality that we live in today. 
we we covered that. And the idea of zoning becomes a core idea of what follows, uh, becomes the Athens Charter out of the work of Corbusier. You see in this higher resolution image that uh, Radburn Garden City, here's the elementary school, the swimming pool, the homes that have the male uh, car sign and the female child side, garden side, that connects to the elementary school, to the pool, to their friends' houses, maybe with an underpass to other neighborhoods. But then after, uh, what happened in 1929? Crash. The crash in the stock market, um, <clears throat> the depression, and so we stopped building. Radburn ended here, and after World War II, when we went back to the business of building after a decade and a half of time away, two decades, uh, we couldn't be bothered with this idea. So instead of uh, there being an interconnected network uh, in the off the backyard, there's just fences. And so that's that became the dominant model for suburbia after World War II. So you had this in history theory two, I believe, where uh, Corbusier uh, traveled throughout Italy and stayed in this monastery, where on one side there was the city side, the male side, and on the other side was the the nature, the view across the valley. And this became the prototype of everything that Corbusier did for the next few decades. The, the actual uh, residency uh, was quite small in relationship to the garden, and it was two stories high. So this two-story uh, house uh, where the, the garden is inside the house. And so that becomes the basis. So he's looking out into his garden that is brought into the house. And so that becomes the archetype for this typology of housing, where you see the monk's cell in every uh, residential unit that he mass produces and uh, he proposes that we mass produce and stack up into. Uh, this idea, uh, 1922, the contemporary city, uh, later the, uh, the Voisin city, named after the automobile company that sponsored his work, and the Radiant City. And this is the idea of towers in the park. And again, this is a visually compelling idea that is dominated by the visual scale. Coming out of the city, beautiful, garden city, it's a visual scale. It's a towers in the park idea that is constructed to um, the ideas of Tony Garvey's zoning from the industrial city. He's, he identifies the four functions of city life, of contemporary life. And then the job is to separate each one from the other. And the way you get from dwelling to work is by car. The way you get from work to recreation, by car. Uh, these are separated so far apart from each other that the walking scale is out of the question. In the 1920s and 1933, when the Athens Charter was written, the car uh, is already uh, showing some signs of unintended consequences, but you can't be distracted by that. A, a city built for the car is a city built for success. And this is the future. Stop whining. Get over it. Buy a car. Grow up. And so the scale of these diagrams, it still has the green belt and the garden city idea, uh, is the scale required by the physical separation of these four functions. The key one that I want to focus on as we zoom forward is the function of the motorway, the circulation function. So once you design the ideal house, the ideal apartment, and you want the ideal relationship to the sun, you line the apartment blocks according to the solar direction, like that. 
And so that's why Alice Hayward Taylor is jiggy jog. It doesn't, it's not parallel to Ruggles. It's, it's tilted. It points north. He's, you know which way is north because uh, of the direction of the buildings. And the space between the buildings become whatever it becomes. That's, you know, that's not even a consideration. So the leftover space, you just plant grass. Or later when you need more parking, you just plant asphalt. And instead of the space of the street being a social space with pedestrians, uh, cars, uh, other users, instead of the space of the street being an outdoor room defined by the building facades on either side, we get rid of the building facades, we pull them back from the street, we eliminate that outdoor room definition, and we uh, pass laws that protect the right of way of automobiles, and these become motorways. And in order to, and we do whatever it takes to ensure the free flow of automobiles at all times. <clears throat> this leads to the segregation of pedestrians away from automobile. Sorry, the High Line is an example of doing just this. And in most places, uh, this has now become illegal. That um, the city of Boston really struggled with the WGBH building because it was a building that stretched over Guest Street. Do you know this building by Polshek? Anyway, these bridges, these pedestrian bridges over the street are increasingly. Uh, against the law in cities because it removes the eyes on the street, it removes people from the street and makes the street um, less safe. Fast forward to Brasilia, uh, really the clearest example of utopian uh, modern city making, uh, all about the visual corridor, not about the human scale. Friends don't let friends try to walk from here to here. It's too hot. Drive there. And one of the places where we see it most dramatically demonstrated is in the transformation of New York City from a city of tenements, this is a mild neighborhood, to a city of these island bound bars, where even the city streets of New York become transformed by the removal of the street wall and uh, <coughs> You know, this, this is the architecture that does not pass the pepper spray test. This is the architecture of Alice Hayward Taylor. So no time except to say that SIAM, uh, the International Congress of Modern Architecture, uh, that is responsible for the Athens Charter, there were a bunch of young architects who were critical of Corbusier and this Charter. And in the 50s, they said, um, give us a shot. And so for the sign, the 10th Siam meeting, Corbusier said, okay, critique away. I'm open to suggestion. And he turned over the, the authority uh, for the 10th meeting of Siam to this group of young architects. And they said, no, not the four, not the four functions. If we separate these four functions in the city, we are defining the human scale. So they were influenced by anthropological uh, norms and ideas. They studied human systems. And they said, it's not the four functions of the city. It's the four scales of human association. And this is the slide that is the foundation of what we do now in the 21st century. We take care of the house scale. Thank you, architects. Uh, city scale, we don't have, we can't be bothered. The scale that really matters and the scale that is most neglected in all of the utopian modernism of the Athens Charter is the scale of the street. So it brings us right back to where we started it's the architecture that we produce and its influence on the streets 
that makes the most difference, has the biggest impact on the world that uh, we leave for those after us. And now we're back to these ideas of Jan Giel. I hope that you had a chance to look at some of the videos that we shared on uh, WhatsApp. I sent a bunch of links to videos. While you're in studio and you're doing something that doesn't take huge, intense attention, why not take in some of these videos and use the ideas in these videos to help guide your independent investigation as you go out in the world, find examples uh, that promise to teach us a thing or two. And, uh, and do the authentic discovery that Jane Jacobs uh, demands that we do as a profession. And figure this stuff out, not based on uh, abstract, intellectually appealing ideas, but from actual lived reality of the most vulnerable users uh, of our society. Can you just do that, please? Okay. As a generation, for your entire careers from now on. Thank you. We really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Any Thank questions you. out there in Zoom land? No. no. Yeah, I think we're good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.